Hey everyone, today I am talking with Dr. Monty Lyman. Dr. Lyman is a research fellow at the University of Oxford and he's also a wonderful writer. He's written two books, The Remarkable Life of the Skin and The Painful Truth. This is a fantastic conversation with Dr. Lyman about the wonders of the body. I think you're gonna like this. Pull up a chair and buckle up. It's the Original Strength Podcast. So Dr. Lyman, you've written two books. Uh, I want to talk to you about the first one, the the remarkable life of the skin. Fascinating, fascinating book, but to be honest, it's probably also a hypo, hypochondriac's nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> that that book, I mean, it, it's really neat. But then when you you go through and talk about all the things that can go wrong with the That's, skin, I was yeah, like, I, I don't want that. Oh gosh, I've ever had that. No, I don't. <laughs> I mean, it, that can mess with you. Certainly. I think my one of my favorite chapters of that book is about the, the skin's microbiome. So the sort of the, the good, the bad and the and the often ugly of the, the microbes that live on our surface. Uh, some of them are good for us uh, and good for our skin's health. Some of them are bad and can cause various skin diseases. And some are just uh, are just downright weird. So one of my favorite ones, which I mean, grosses people out, is that they're on the skin of about sort of a third of us, roughly. Uh, we have something called demodex mites which are tiny little microscopic mites that uh, look like something out of an alien film. Sort of the, the front half of it's like a spider and the back half of it's like a, like a worm. And they uh, um, live in our sort of the area between the bridge of our nose and in our eyebrows, sort of clinging to the, the tree-like stumps of our, um, our eyebrow hairs. They only, they only come out at night. Uh, well, the males traveling around a couple of millimeters an hour looking for a, looking for a mate. Um, and all they do, they, they're, they're sort of like the, the garbage collectors of our skin. So they're quite good. They, they remove sort of dead excess skin. The, the issue is that they, putting it politely, they don't have a, a backside. So basically they, as they, they eat over the course of their, they eat dead skin over the course of their, I think, lifespan, which is a couple of weeks, they just get bigger and bigger and bigger until they explode. And sometimes the microbes that live inside them uh, cause various skin diseases, inflammatory skin diseases, like rosacea, the sort of the, the inflammation around the nose. So that's probably one of the grossest facts. I don't want to put, put everyone off uh, for reading the book, but yeah, it, it's definitely a hypochondriac's nightmare. See, so, yeah, it's stuff like that, that was like, I was like, oh, I don't, I don't know <laughs> if I want to know this, but now I know it and I can't unknow it. Um, so, no, it's so true. And I think it's, and but some, sometimes the really weird stuff, uh, can become quite beneficial. So um, a big area of research in skin uh, is, is sort of microbiome transplants or uh, adding good bacteria. We all know about sort of adding good bacteria for our gut microbiome, but actually various skin diseases. Um, so just think things like eczema and psoriasis that are inflammatory, uh, are often respond to anti-inflammatory microbes. And there was even one study where they did a, uh, um, uh, an underarm microbe transplant of uh, a pair of twins one of whom happened to have quite bad body odor and the other one didn't smell at all. Um, so what they did is they scraped off some of the skin from the, uh, um, well, they got them both not to wash for a few, um, few days and they got the, the one who didn't smell not to, not to wash for a few days. They scraped off some sort of skin shavings from his, under, from his armpits, placed them on the armpits of the other, uh, other twin and his body odor was completely, completely cured, completely gone for, I think it was a, a year after that sort of, that microbe transplant. So I think lots of interesting avenues in terms of uh, yeah, the creepy crawlies that, that live on our skin. That is, that is weird. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so in your book too, you, you seem to have traveled all over the world uh, investigating strange skin diseases and things like that. Mm. So are you kind of like the Sherlock Holmes of, of skin? Well, I, I have been around a, a number of different uh, Sherlock Holmeses of skin in, in different parts of the world. And what was, what was really interesting, what, I, what fascinates me about the skin is, uh, on, on, on one level, it's, it's, it's fascinating physically from a sort of immunology point of view. A lot of my background is in, is in immunology, but also it's a deeply psychological and, and social organ. So I'll just say to one little story of uh, when I was in uh, northern Tanzania, I was, uh, so I was working and helping out in a, um, a specialist dermatology center. 
and one of the dermatologists there, so I'm not a dermatologist, um, he was called out to go to a, uh, to the Serengeti, to go to a, a Maasai village where they had a boy with a very strange skin condition. So I traveled with this um, Tanzanian uh, dermatologist uh, to the village and we went into one of the huts and we sat, sat around with the elders and there was this boy about 14, 14, 15 years old. And he had this really weird uh, rash that was sort of blistering rash across bits of his face um, and bits of his chest, but that was about it. it was re- I'd never seen any of anything like it in the textbooks. So I turned to this dermatologist who had no idea what it was as well. They kept asking different questions um, and kept probing, kept probing. And he found out that this uh, boy was meant to be going out on, on what they called walkabout. So for a, as part of a sort of rite of passage, um, the young men of the village would go out into the savannah for about a year and to, to, to fend for themselves. And then they'd, they'd come back a man. And clearly this boy didn't want to do that. So what he'd done um, secretly, he'd gone out into the savannah He'd uh, found the sap of a plant that people knew that if you rubbed it onto your skin and you put it in the sun, it basically burned you know, blistered your skin. So he had, he had, in a sense, created a skin disease on himself. His, his mind, in a way, was his mental stress was manifesting in that way on his skin. Um, and so that's called, um, in sort of dermatologist Greek, it's called dermatitis artifacta, sort of fake skin disease. Um, but the the dermatologist, the very clever dermatologist who found this out, the Tanz- Tanzanian dermatologist, uh, calls it Monday syndrome because often school kids uh, do it before they go to school, and it happens, you know, in in the West um, uh, as well, but often, often presents quite differently. I think in the West we just say, "Mom, I'm not feeling so good today." <laughs> <laughs> the trouble is, my uh, my mum's a, a nurse, and she has sort of no sympathy, oh. never had any any sympathy for me, so. Yeah, you're going to take a hairdryer or something and make your forehead hot or something. You got <laughs> to sell it. So of all the things you learned about the skin, um, and I, I, I want readers, because I don't want to give away too much about the book. So uh, let me, So instead of like really diving in, what could you give a brief synopsis of what are the best ways you have found mm. to keep the skin happy and healthy? Well, that's, that's a really good. That's a really good question, and I think um, I orig- I it, just as I, after I'd written the book, I probably um, would focus on on physical things about. Um, so I, I think there are, there are two elements to looking after your skin, and firstly, that is just being healthy. So it's whether it's eating eating healthily. There's a lot of evidence that, that a good diet is good for the skin. Often a lot of things that you actually externally do on your skin aren't uh, often they're often cosmetic and they don't affect often don't affect the health of the skin. But also exercising um, and, and keeping fit makes a big difference to skin health and can reduce inflammation as well. Um, but something that I didn't really think about when I was writing the book is that actually um, to look after our skin, we need to look after our ourselves as as, as humans as people, uh, looking after our our minds. So stress and and mental distress uh, can worsen and sometimes create um, skin diseases. And that's why I didn't realize when I was writing the book, actually, I realized that actually our our body and our minds are hugely intertwined. And often in in Western medicine, we are, we are very dualist. We are, you know, there are diseases of the the body and there are diseases of the mind and they're completely separate. But actually, uh, with skin health and with a lot of health, a lot of general body health, um, uh, looking after ourselves uh, and our, our, our mental well-being is hugely important and and often overlooked, often overlooked by doctors. So that I think that's the kind of that's, that's an often overlooked area that I think um, that, that I think people should really really take note of for their for their general health. So as often seems to be the case for for the whole person, it goes back to movement, nutrition, and self care. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think that's you know there are there are you know you can go down quite more more detailed avenues with that, um, but but generally um, things that you know make the body do what it's meant to do, uh, and reducing stress can, can can make a huge amount of difference. Obviously, in, in some, some situations, um, you know, specific medical help is needed, of course. But I think gen- for general body health, for general skin health, for general mental health, I think that's that's the way to go. So speaking of of health. Um, in the book, it's kind of apparent that 
skin can be a treasure trove of wonderful sensational experiences mm. or it can be like a torture chamber of horrific experiences mm. um, and very painful uh, a, a painful life it is which leads me to your next book is mm. is that what kind of steered you down the road to to writing the the painful truth yeah that's a really a really interesting um question i yeah i didn't i didn't plan to um to, to, to write up to write anything on pain or to explore pain at all it sort of it sort of came to me um as i you know, seeing it as a, as a as a problem that i think needs to be addressed um so i think how i came from 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 skin to writing about pain is that when i was researching the book about skin i was i was researching a bit about pain and i wanted to learn a bit more about um pain receptors and pain fibers and the sort of biological mechanisms of how pain sort of as at the time I thought sort of traveled from the, the body and went to the brain. But the more research that I, I did, I realized that that's actually not the case at all. And I, I fundamentally uh, misunderstood what pain is. And I, I also believe that most people, including lots of doctors, uh, fundamentally misunderstand what, what pain is. And that is, that is playing a huge part in our, our chronic pain crisis that we have um, in, in, the, in the whole world, not just the developed world. So I was, so at the time of, of, of writing the, um, the book on skin, I was, uh, I was also working as a, as a junior doctor in a busy acute medical ward. Um, and it was just, it was, I was, it was really busy, really stressful. And it's sort of like a, um, basically the, the ward would be where patients would come in from into the into ED or ER, I think in the US. Yes. Uh, and then and then we'd go around and see whether they should be either taken you know, by the medical team, whether they should be discharged, whether, whether they should go to specific wards, or if not, whether they should go to another team like, like surgery. And um, I was following this really, uh, you know, a, re a really good consultant, so senior, senior doctor, and going from patient to patient. And we came across this man, um, let's call him Paul, it's not his, uh, not his real name, uh, a man in his mid-40s uh, with a really severe lower back pain. He it started about a bit less than a year beforehand. He, he said it was due to a sort of a, a conked out office chair. And then it had been, it started on sort of the right-hand side of his lower back. But then over the weeks and months, it had spread to the left-hand side and up his back and down his leg a little bit as well. And over the past few weeks, it had gone so bad um, that he basically couldn't couldn't get out of his just couldn't, just couldn't get out of bed basically. Um, at, at the time, he was um, going through an incredibly uh, difficult divorce as well, mm -hmm. and in, and so he was brought into the emergency department because he didn't want to go and see his family doctor. And they did a number of tests on him, um, and so they did blood tests to look for to look for various things as well as an MRI scan of his whole spine. And then the consultant had all these results and walked over to, to Paul and looked through the results and said to Paul, the good news is there's nothing physically wrong with you. To which Paul then said, you know, I'm completely understandably sort of clutching his back. Say, he said, are you saying it's all in my head then? And it was just at that point as a, as a first year junior doctor, I realized that um, most of us believe a fundamental untruth about pain. So Paul, when he, when he was discharged, either, to, to, so basically he was left thinking either the pain is caused by some kind of physical damage in the body that, that no one can detect, or it's uh, some kind of you know, mental disorder, so something that he's imagining. But the thing is both of those, both of those things in, in most cases are, are wrong. So, so in my, in my um, in my in my upcoming book, I, I, I say that most of us are under the uh, are sort of enthralled by the great painful untruth, which is the belief that pain is an accurate measure of tissue damage. Uh, whereas actually, um, pain is a protector. That's the, that's the sort of the pain the painful truth that I talk about. Pain is a a protective uh, protective mechanism, and it's so important to understand that, um, especially for people living with. Um, long-term persistent chronic pain and I, and I believe it's a way of saying that often that, that well that all pain is is made in the brain but it's not sort of all in your head 
Um, so it's, it's it's very it's it's I think it's a, it's a very um it's a, it's a revolutionary truth that modern pain science has revealed over the last sort of two decades. Well, well maybe a bit more than that. It's sort of been built on lots of research. Um, but that's sort of what I'm what I'm focusing on. And why I think it's so important is that chronic pain, or I, I prefer to call it persistent pain, is is a huge huge issue um, across the world. Uh, imagine a disease that affects between a fifth and a quarter of your population. It is, uh, it can be lifelong. It's it's often life ruining. It can ruin ruin functioning, um, social interactions. It can ruin sex life. It ruins sort of every aspect of someone's whole um, whole world. Um, and it's a di it's a disease that is the number one cause of work related absence, um, costing your economy billions. And it was only, but this is a disease that was only classified as a disease in 2019 uh, internationally. And medical students only spend about 12, 13 hours of their six year medical degree. This is in the UK, learning about it. That's chronic pain, that's persistent pain. And I believe that most people and often a lot of healthcare practitioners don't, don't, don't understand it. And I think that's, that's the revolution we need to, we need to undertake. So if, Oh, that's a lot. There's a lot there. Um, yes, if, yes. if pain does not mean physical damage mm. and maybe pain doesn't even mean there's anything physically wrong, like it's not being caused by physical incidences or injuries or accidents or wear and tear, then, and it's a protective mechanism. Well, like, how do you treat, like, cause I'm thinking conventional treatment is like, well, take these painkillers or, you know, I don't know, like, what, how, what does that lead to? Yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a really good question. And I think I need to, to caveat a number of things. So the often short term pain, um, known as acute pain, is often very much associated with with tissue damage. It's, it's usually um, uh, so, for example, you, know, you, you slam, you know, your, you squash your thumb under your laptop, it hurts. You slam it in a car door, it hurts even more. Yes, it does. <laughs> um, so, so that is that is that is pain. And what's quite important, what's important to know is that um, what is transmitting that information, the information that's coming from your thumb to your brain, that isn't that's not a that, that isn't detected by pain receptors, and it's not a pain signal. It's it's actually something called nociception. And if there was one sort of technical word, medical word that I wish everyone knew, it would be nociception which essentially is, is danger detection. And that danger signal travels up through the spine to the brain. And the brain has to make a decision. Um, and the brain's decision is this, and this is completely subconscious. The brain has to make a decision. Okay, is, um, is this information I'm getting, is this danger, um, is this information I'm getting, whether it's visual or from these danger receptors, is this dangerous? Is it a threat? And if there's enough evidence to the brain that there is something threatening the body, the brain will create pain. Uh, it's, it's pain is, you could say, it's the, the brain's opinion of what's going on. It's the, the brain's decree. But what, so that's, so, so that's sort of acute pain, short-term pain. And often in short-term pain, obviously painkillers are very useful. So, you know, and I've spent a lot of time in, in surgical wards and in my junior doctor years, you know, and you know, morphine and, and opioids are, are wonder drugs in the short term. But the, the frustrating thing about pain is that often uh, the brain can learn to embed pain inside the brain. If pain is repeated, the, the brain, the spine and the brain can essentially get better at learning pain. So even when the, whatever tissue damage was there before, even once that is healed, the, the pain can still exist. And that's not imaginary, you know, it's, it's, it's wired into the brain, it's, it's neurological, you know, for example, epilepsy, we see that as completely real. Chronic pain is, is no less real than that, if that makes sense. So to answer your question about what kind of treatments can we, can we have for pain if um, the pain is a protective mechanism? So for, for chronic pain, for long-term pain, and that's pain that lasts uh, usually after the amount of time for tissue in, a tissue injury to heal. So that's um, so international classifications usually say about three months, but it varies. If that pain persists, 
um, often the best routes of reducing that pain and living with that pain. Um, I call it sort of, I call it soothing the brain, letting the brain know that the brain is safe in its body, giving the brain information, information cues of safety and fewer cues of threat, if that makes sense. Um, so important, th I think the most important initial thing is, is pain education, is, is actually just undergoing reading and or teaching and training as to, as to with, with someone who's really empathetic um, as to what pain is and what it isn't. I think that's really important. But then af after that, I think activities that, that make the brain feel safe in its body, I think movement is possibly the biggest one, possibly the greatest one. Um, and that can be really tough because you know, often it's, you know, it's painful when I move, so I don't, I don't want to move. And it's, it's important to have to be to be assessed properly by my therapist and depending on the depending on the pain as well um, to see, be seen by a doctor to rule out certain red flag symptoms and things like that. But all the evidence suggests that that move, you know, we were made to move. And um, there's a great quote that I like by someone called Dave Moen, which is um, it's the risk of um, oh, what is it? What is it? So the, the, the risk of uh, movement is less than the, the is, is less than the risk of being sedentary. Um, you know, being sedentary, uh, not moving is a terrible, is, is, is a disease in and of itself. So movement's a huge one. Also, there are various sort of psychological therapies that can help. I'm not saying that, I'm not saying that pain is a psychological condition, it's not. Um, but there are a huge number of, of, of therapies that can be really helpful to make the brain feel safe in its body. Um, and and there, are, so there are various other things like sort of anything that reduces stress um, is, is helpful for reducing chronic pain. And then uh, I could, could, could go into this, but I, I won't go down that rabbit hole right now. Um, there are, so pain is, is a social disease and various social things can make pain worse or make pain better. And those Sounds are things, like that. yeah, oh, definitely, definitely. And I think it's things that need to be addressed by society uh, by those those in pain, but those who are, are near to them, and something that I, I say in the book is is uh, pain should drive us to love. I think that's really important. Um, whether it's whether it, whether it's for those of us who aren't in persistent pain, whether it's those who are in pain who need to l learn to love themselves, um, and uh, for society as a whole. I think it. It sounds very airy fairy, but there's a huge amount of different strands of, of, of science behind that and things that work. So that's a number of different things. It's you know, I've got to be careful that there's obviously, as, as you well know, that there is there's no one specific solution to, to every kind of pain. Um, and, and and there are lots of caveats and complexities. If you think about long term opioids and the opioid crisis as well, that's another very complex, controversial, quite emotive area. Um, but I think uh, therapies that make the brain feel safe in its body are hugely useful for helping people live with pain, diminish it, diminish it, and sometimes even even eliminate it. And and you can some people can eliminate it or it can go away. Like so, so you're never stuck uh, where you're at. Even if it, it, I mean, I know it can like in the darkest night it can seem so hopeless and helpless, yeah. but that doesn't mean you're stuck there. No, that's great. No, that's great. That's, that's completely true. And I think um, two things I focus on as well are two sort of mindsets uh, are uh, the developing developing a mindset that we all need, whether you're in pain or not, is developing mindsets of acceptance on the one hand and hope on the other. And now acceptance isn't giving up and giving in. It's just being realistic. It's not fi it's not fighting whatever you're going through. It's not fighting the pain. Um, Whereas hope is knowing that actually, yes, there is so much evidence that with a lot of, often with a lot of effort and time, things can get a lot better. Um, and a lot of, a lot of what I've been saying about making the brain feel safe in its body is about essentially rewiring the brain through something called neuroplasticity. The brain is very changeable. But learning to do that is like, it's like learning to play, you know, the cello from scratch or learning um, you know, a, new, a new language. 
it's it, will t- it often takes time and it will take help and you need good people with you um but it but the evidence suggests that it that it does work one I, I think i might bring in a sort of metaphor about about pain that i find quite helpful um and can sort of help with sort of acceptance and hope but also talking about the brain feeling safe in its body so i have a um right well, well i grew up with a um two dogs to lab um, labradingers so spring a spaniel half labrador and we got them as rescue my parents got them as rescue dogs uh, at about eight months old and so kiki who was the, the um so they were a boy and a girl kiki was the girl and she was a lovely dog um didn't she seemed like she'd had a very happy puppyhood at this other home that she'd been been at but one day one of my friends came over called jock called josh who's quite a distinctive look sort of six foot two or something quite short blonde hair and when she saw him she completely freaked out she put her body between the two of us to to, to protect me she started barking she wet herself she was quivering and she did not want to go anywhere near this person but uh, but only this person and it was you, you know you can, you can sort of guess that maybe in those eight months before she went to the rescue center you know someone who looked very much like josh had either sort of abused her or threatened her or her owner. So now she was associating uh, any, anyone that looked like this the previous person as, as a threat. Now, for, for Kiki to like Josh and to get on with him, I couldn't shout at her, I couldn't get angry with her because that would just make things worse. But also I couldn't sit down with her and say, now Kiki, let's talk, let's talk about this rationally. You know, Josh is completely harmless. Um, you know, don't worry about him at all. Um, but she, she wouldn't she wouldn't understand that and she would still see him as a threat. So what I had to do to make Kiki feel relaxed and safe with Josh was give her evidence that Josh was safe. So I'd spend time uh, joking around with him in the same room as her and she'd be right away in the corner. And then eventually and get him to play with her brother and then eventually get him to throw the ball for her. And slowly but surely, for sort of one step back for every three steps forward, she began to realise that Josh, my friend, was not a threat. And I, I, I feel that often that, that persistent pain, pain generally, is often like that dog. And I think it's so important to know that pain, even when it's ruining our life with persistent pain, is always trying to help us. It's always trying. To, it's being overprotective, but it's always trying to help us. And I think just getting that that mindset is just the first step to to healing so if i'm tracking with you um acute pain can have a a physical cause but chronic pain is almost like sort of like a pav pavlov's dog effect to the acute pain and then through habit um it just gets good at keeping the pain going and and the brain wants to feel safe and a safe brain, probably not a lot of pain, but an unsafe brain probably magnifies the pain or, or draws it out. So how important then, because, you know, when people are faced with issues of pain and things like that, chronic pain, and they start mm-hmm. thinking, well, this is never going to go away. My life is over. This sucks. How, I guess my question is, how important are thoughts when it comes to the information that you're feeding your own brain? as far as diving you down into pain or helping you get away from it? There's the um, the whole idea about thoughts and and behaviors and and, and changing the way we think and things like that is, it's it's gonna be quite nuanced because there there is talk sometimes about um, sort of of toxic positivity in in a sense of trying to say, you know, if you just believe, if you just say that you're gonna get better and if you just change the way you think about it, everything's gonna get better Therefore, you know, you're not getting better because you haven't, you know, you're not, you know, you're, you're still being miserable, you're still being anxious, you know, stop being anxious, which is, which is <laughs> you know, uh, if, if anyone tells you to say stop being anxious is, I mean, not to, say that, yeah, not to mention that the subconscious doesn't listen to words like don't and stop, it just focuses on anxious. Um, yeah, it's a really good question. And I think sometimes psychological therapies, so something like acceptance and commitment therapy, there's cognitive behavioral therapy as well. Um, Therapy is designed to, to, to change the way that um, our, 
the relationship between our, our thoughts and, and behaviors and ruminations and things like that, they can be helpful. They can be very helpful for people uh, living with persistent pain. But some, the evidence shows that on their own, they're not hugely effective. They seem to be really effective for some people, but not for others. So I think to really be able to change, to change mindsets, to change thoughts, ultimately it's about changing knowledge um, and the whole framework generally, which is why I, I think that pain education, a modern um, pain education is, 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 really, is really useful, um, done by people who, who really know what they're talking about. So there are a couple of, um, I mean, these didn't really exist until a few years ago, but there are a couple of, um, in the UK at least, I know of some organisations that are doing really, really great jobs at explaining what pain is. So that's why I think that's the first, the first key. But then, you know, it's not just thoughts. I think movement's hugely important. Um, finding someone who can help you move, feel safe to move, um, and feel safe to get to become strong and, and, and sort of act like humans are meant to, is it, it takes a lot of effort and, and it, it needs someone who is, who is, you know, who is really encouraging and is um, sort of based in the science as well. And I think doing is as important as thinking. So whether it's um, whether it's learning how to, to move, um, learning breathing exercise as well, changing diet as well. I think one one strand of, of this, and I'm, I'm, I don't want to make it too complex, but we think the evidence. So basically, I was, I was, I was talking about how short term becomes long term pain and gets embedded in the brain. One of the ways that this happens, or can make it worse, this whole process called sensitization, is is inflammation. And there's evidence that inflammation in the brain, sort of chronic low grade inflammation can make this worse. So actually things like having a healthy diet as well um, can be really good for, for reducing this inflammation. And that's another thing that movement does. There's a lot of evidence to say that the movement actually reduces uh, inflammation in the body in the long term. So, so that's part of making the brain feel safe in its body, but it's a bit more nuanced because looking is looking at that inflammation. So it's fascinating and it's funny, it's neat to me. So when I asked you what are the, the best things you could do for the skin, mm -hmm. you mentioned three things and you kind of mm -hmm. just mentioned three things for making your brain feel safe in your body, nutrition, movement, and self-care techniques. I mean, so again, for the whole person, brain, skin, the whole system, moving, nutrition, and self, you know, just taking care of yourself, being aware of yourself. I think that's that. Yeah, that's really interesting, and I've got hit the nail on the head there. And I think, I think that is a, that is a strand of why I felt so comfortable moving from skin to to pain, some kind of seemingly quite different different topics. And actually, my work at the moment, and I will be working in. So basically, I'm a I'm a I'm a doctor. I've just started, and I've just started my specialty training, which will be in the world of psychiatry, um, wow. and. Uh, but part of my time is spent doing research uh, at the University of Oxford. I'm based in Oxford on immunopsychiatry. So it's kind of it's the it's the new the new research on how uh, inflammation can affect mental health, whether it's depression or even psychosis, um, bipolar. Lo lots of lots of mental health conditions can be affected by inflammation in the in the body. So actually, in that whole area of of, of mental health. Those things of that, that reduce that in a sense make the brain feel safe in its body, but also reduce inflammation. Things like movement and nutrition are hugely important uh, for general mental health as well. So I think it's just just realizing that you know coming from medical school training in the, in the West that's very um, very biological. I mean Western medicine has been fantastic in lots of different ways, but I think one thing we we miss is the relationship between the mind, the mind and the body that we're in you know, holistic medicine, often, you know, in, I don't know what, what, what it's like in the States, but often if I'm talking, you're talking to what, sort of cynical, some cynical doctors, if you, you know, you also have the sort of the, the eye, the eye roll reflex, if you talk about holistic medicine, but it's, 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 it's clear that this is, this is so important for, for, for health generally, every, every kind of, uh, I, yeah. I think it's the same here. We, uh, everybody, I mean, you want to, you want to make things simple. So you put them in boxes and you separate everything out for these are parts. These are pieces. 
this system over here, that system over there, they won't have anything to do with each other when <laughs> they could, that couldn't be further from the truth where everything affects everything. That's so true. And I think um, often people who go into healthcare and, and science, whether it's scientists, um, uh, sort of physiotherapists, doctors, or everyone basically, um, tend on average, they tend to be the people that like, I mean, most humans do like things in boxes. You know, there's something, there's a, um, patient comes in with a maybe an interesting but recognizable symptom you've got some medications that you can um, treat them with and they're treated and they're on their way home you know done and dusted but pain is um just focusing on pain pain is sort of pain is messy pain is human and you could say that you know m most illness is is messy and human and complex you know, we the, the model that we we sort of aspire to even though it, I think I think it's the best model we have uh, is sort of the, the biopsychosocial model that and the biological, the psychological and the social hugely influence health and disease. But often those things, you know, but, but seeing biopsychosocial, those things aren't always completely separate. It's, um, it's, it's quite complex. But I think the good, th the good thing is that complex systems so that the human body uh, is a complex system and we're embedded in our society, our surroundings, which is a, a complex system. That solutions to complex problems, say like pain or chronic pain, don't necessarily need complex. Sorry, 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 uh, complex problems don't necessarily need complex solutions. Um, one change can can have a sort of an exponential effect on changing the rest of the system. Whether that whether that change is is moving. So say, say for example, if you if you're living with um, a persistent pain and you get have someone um, who is really enthusiastic and is knowledgeable and is helping you through slowly but surely gradually uh, being comfortable and moving. Not only are you um, physiologically helping your body, but you're helping yourself go and meet friends and go and socialize, which has huge effects on your physical and mental health. Uh, it also reduces inflammation, which, you know, lots of things are happening just by doing that, that one thing. Does that make sense? So it's sort of, it's so, so complex, we're complex systems as humans embedded in a complex system, which is our environment, but, and you can get complex, a lot of complex problems, but solutions to those problems don't have to be, have to be complex. I, I think you, and you may not know you did this, I mean, but you might, I mean, I think you solved the solution. You offered the solution early on when you said pain should drive us to love. Mm. I think that's your solution. That's, that's a really good point. And, and I mean, doesn't have to be complicated. <laughs> <laughs> so Dr. Lyman, this has been awesome. When can people, when does the painful truth come out? When can people find that? Um, so the, uh, the painful truth is coming out on the 15th of July. Unfortunately, that's just in the UK. What? Uh, but I know, <laughs> I know it's rubbish, but there will be an American, Amer a US version coming out at, at some point. And I'll, I'll let you know when that, when that's happening. But the, the Remarkable Life of the Skin, for those who are potentially interested in that, um, that, is, that is already out uh, in the US. And, yeah. and you should be interested in the, the Remarkable Life of the Skin because it's it's a very fascinating book. If you, I will warn you, if you're a hypochondriac, take it slow. <laughs> that, is the, that is the risk. Yeah. <laughs> but there's some very, very amazing information in that book about your body and 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 the wonder of, of, of just being you. Um, <laughs> But really excited about the painful truth. Uh, I, this, I, I think that is going to be amazing. Um, I will, when that comes out in the UK, I will put the notes in the show uh, for, for where people can find or where they can find that. Um, anything else you want to, to add? Or I, I, I don't think so. Thank you so much for that, uh, for that chat. Really, really interesting questions. Um, yeah, and drawing those, all those topics together was, yeah, loved it. No, Dr. Lyman, you're on fire, man. You are doing great things. Um, I look forward to your third and fourth book as well. Oh, yes. <laughs> but well, guys, thank you so much for listening to the Original Strength Podcast. Dr. Lyman, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks, Tim. Thanks for listening, everyone. Have a great weekend.